We will take our reading from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. The message of the cross is complete foolishness to those who are headed for ruin. But to us who are experiencing salvation, it is the power of God. Yes, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block for the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those who are called Jews and Gentiles alike. Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Again, words taken from St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the early 4th century, there was a good woman named Helen. She's now known as St. Helen, and she was the mother of the Emperor Constantine, and also the foundress of the actual true cross upon which our blessed Lord hung in atonement for our sins. St. Helen and her son Constantine saw the power of the Holy Cross and saw it as a great treasure. Constantine, seeking to defeat his enemies and to establish his reign as emperor, prayed to the true God for a sign of victory. And the Almighty answered the prayer of this pagan with the vision in the sky of a flaming cross along with the words, In hoc signo vinces, written underneath. In this sign you shall conquer. And immediately Constantine ordered that the cross be made the symbol of victory and banner of his whole army. And later Constantine would receive another vision in a dream of that same cross and would order his soldiers to paint a red cross upon their shields. And in October of the year 312 A.D., Constantine and his army gained a tremendous victory at the Battle of Milvian Bridge. He then later entered into Rome as conqueror and established the true religion, Christianity, as the one religion of the entire Roman Empire. Now, St. Helen, again the mother of that great emperor, wished to find this treasure that had brought so much victory to her son. And so she went down to the Holy Land in the early part of the 4th century to find the actual piece of wood. 200 years before her arrival, an emperor, a pagan emperor, had covered up Mount Calvary with a large mound of dirt. In fact, all the places of the early Christians were buried under rubble purposely. And also the same pagan emperor put a statue of Jupiter upon Golgotha along with a temple dedicated to the goddess Venus upon the very site upon which our Lord died for our sins. And all this was done, of course, to stop Catholics from publicly worshiping the Son of God at these holy sites. But when St. Helen came to Jerusalem years later, she had all that rubble removed in order to reveal the holy places once again. The mother of the emperor also had the heathen temple and pagan altar on top of Calvary destroyed. She then hired more than a 100 workmen to dig up that mound of earth around Golgotha until they found a number of crosses that had been used for executions in earlier times. And St. Helen, a practical woman, eventually identified the cross of our Lord when a cripple was healed and a dying woman was cured at the touch of one particular piece of wood. Now, a large section of that cross was placed in a church in Jerusalem. But in the year 615 A.D., this most holy relic was stolen by the king of Persia. And after much prayer and fasting, as well as a major battle of the Christians, the true cross was recovered and brought back to the holy city. And according to countless eyewitnesses, the victorious Christian emperor carried that precious relic upon his shoulders within a silver case. But as he was about to take a step in Jerusalem, he found himself unable to make another move. There was a force holding him back. The bishop of that city then came forward and suggested that the emperor disrobe of all of his fine silk and jewels. And having done so, having taken off even his shoes and wearing sackcloth, this emperor walked into the city along with that cross, that precious relic. 
Now, perhaps our dearest Lord allowed this precious remain of his holy cross to be removed for a time so that people and members of the church would ever more appreciate this banner of the cross, this banner of the king, the throne of Christ, his instrument over victory, his victory over sin, death, and Satan. Now, countless men, countless men have gone out in search of treasure. Conquistadors went out in search of gold. You have people like Ponce de Leon who went out in search of the fountain of youth because supposedly it brought bodily immortality. And others have risked their lives and spent their fortunes to track down the Holy Grail, the precious chalice our Lord used at the Last Supper. But why would anyone go out and search or seek to recapture the remains of the Holy Cross of the Son of God? Why would St. Helen spend herself to find an instrument of execution, to find a dead piece of wood that was purposely used to humiliate, torture, and yes, kill Jesus Christ? Why would a war be fought to recover such a scandalous item upon which Christ was literally nailed? Was it worth it? The cross, dear people, has infinite worth. It's a price that could never be measured. Gold may shine and diamonds may glitter, but nothing can compare to that cross which was literally soaked with the precious blood of the Lamb of God. And from this wood, a fountain has issued forth that brings us far more than just youthful looks. Rather, it brings literally eternal life. We now have the cross. We have the throne of Christ the King. We have his chair of wisdom. We have his holy pulpit from which he preached a most beautiful sermon of seven last words. The Holy Cross, dear people, is not dead wood. Rather, it is the life-giving tree whose leaves are a medicine offering a remedy for our sins and whose divine fruit provides a diet that brings intimate union with the most blessed trinity. And yes, the Holy Cross unites God and man, heaven and earth, the vertical and the horizontal, until it forms that perfect T. It's a saving power that reaches in every direction, north, south, and east, and west, and the shade from the tree of the cross overshadows all men. The cross is the great banner of Christ the King, and it is a weapon wielded by the greatest warrior of charity ever to fight. And the Holy Cross, that mighty sword, while proving life-giving to many, has also been the death of our enemies. Having been thrust deep into the earth, the cross has defeated the devil below. It has sliced through the spear of the world. And yes, it has literally cut open graves and raised men from the dead. And yes, this holy instrument... This most sacred relic has proven to be a ladder, a Jacob's ladder that will be the means of our ascent to glory. Now, we recall in the most sacred scriptures how the apostate Jews, the high priests and their underlings, came to the cowardly Pontius Pilate and pushed him pushed him to change the inscription written on top of the cross, that I-N-R-I, Jesus of Nazareth, Rex Judeorum, the King of the Jews. These Jews pleaded with Pilate to edit the inscription, that the criminal upon the cross only said, only pretended that he was King of the Jews. But for once, for once, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, showed guts, and he cried out, quod scripsi, scripsi. What I have written, I have written. Thus we have the first solemn acknowledgement and public enthronement of Christ the King upon the Holy Cross. But you know, that same dark spirit that moved those Jewish high priests has also moved various liberals and modernists to remove the cross from public view to take away the king's banner, to topple him from his rightful throne, and to take away from us our only hope to climb to heaven. You know, when the emperor Constantine established Catholicism as the religion, the religion of the empire, Christ the king was publicly enthroned, and not only in the hearts of men, 
but also in the public life of nations. The banner of his cross, the very throne upon which he was nailed and crowned with thorns, was publicly displayed and worshipped. But with the advent, the coming of the advent, or rather the coming of the modern age, there has been another Good Friday. Another Good Friday where secular high priests and their various mobs cry out, we will not have him reign over us because we have no king but Caesar. Not only did modern statesmen and judges refuse to erect any Christian images and symbols in their countries, but they began to tear down existing ones in order to placate members of various secular humanist groups. Even so-called Catholic schools have removed the crucifix from classrooms, saying that it causes offense to some. And when our president spoke a few years ago at Georgetown University, a school of the Jesuit tradition, the cross and our Lord's most holy name were covered up with black cloth and plywood in order to showcase the stars and stripes in the presidential podium. This is a spirit that is out there and has been there for decades. I think most of us have heard of Madeline Murray O'Hare. The adults especially remember Ms. O'Hare. She was born in 1919 in the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and supposedly raised by church-going parents. She claimed, Ms. O'Hare that is, claimed that she had become an atheist after reading the entire Bible in her early teens. Madeline Murray O'Hare became a household term when she contested the required prayer and Bible reading in her son William's Baltimore area public school. The Supreme Court, then under the infamous Chief Justice Earl Warren, delivered its eight to one verdict in favor of Ms. O'Hare. The court eliminated not only obligatory school prayer, but also Bible readings in public schools. And after the decision, Madeline stated that she wasn't done. She had just begun the fight. She was going to challenge all kinds of other church-state matters. She would eventually take on the tax-exempt status of religious groups, as well as working to remove in God we trust from our nation's currency notes If there was a cross or any Christian symbol or any Ten Commandments monument displayed in any part of North America, she was there with her objections and she would bring legal action. But as one observer noted, Madeline was simply following the ideals of Thomas Jefferson when it came to the issue of religion and government. Keep them as separate as possible, a wall of division. Her personal rejection, her personal apostasy was but a natural consequence of a social rejection, a social apostasy in modern Western nations. By the way, in August of 1995, Miss O'Hare, at the age of 76, mysteriously disappeared along with two of her family members. It wasn't until six years later that their remains were discovered on a 5,000-acre farm in Texas. The killings were particularly grisly. It seems that Madeline had been dismembered, and her body was only identified by matching the serial number on her metal hip replacement. An atheist and former employee of Miss O'Hare had done the dastardly deed. But then again, as the Bible says, one reaps what one sows. Recently, in order to become more inclusive to the people of different religious backgrounds, a Protestant group in Michigan decided to remove its 40-foot steel cross that adorned the exterior of its church building as it might exclude someone from entering. One member of the group commented, we honor the cross, sort of, but the cross is just one of many symbols in our community. But, you know, even modernists within the true church have long desired to relegate the gospel of the cross of St. Paul to oblivion. 
More than a few Catholic churches are missing crucifixes, preferring instead to have the resurrected Christ over the holy altar. And so whether it be secular state or weak-kneed versions of Christianity, a new paganism has arisen, which has heaped tons of legalistic rubble, mounds of bureaucratic dirt, and religiously correct gravel upon the once Christian West in order to cover up the cross of Christ. New pagan temples have arisen during this time of social apostasy with the idols of an all-powerful secular state, idols of false gods of socialism, idols of immorality and sensuality and addictions. And so Christ's throne, the very banner of the King of Kings, finds no home whatsoever in government buildings. It is literally illegal. And yes, we witness the creation of the most ungodly laws as a result. Our God has become our belly, as we find the crucifix does not fit in most modern homes, where luxuries, laziness, and licentious behavior hold sway. We gaze a lot more upon the TV and the computer screen than we do upon love crucified. The cross does not find a place in schools, and youth delinquency grows despite all those anti-drug and anti-bullying programs. The cross does not hang in workplaces or banks, and we wonder, why is there so much greed, fraud, injustice, and theft, despite all the laws and penalties that governments enact? And yes, so-called modern artists view the crucifix as an enemy, and they create the most blasphemous works against our Lord. How we need new Constantines. New St. Helens, new Catholic men to unearth all that rubble so that the cross may once again be revealed and shine forth as the sign of salvation, bringing grace and healing to governments, grace and healing to homes, grace and healing to families, schools, the economy, the arts. The cross is our only hope, for it is the very instrument that brings us to heaven. And that is why the devil wishes to hide the cross from our view. It must be covered up so that we might reject that cross and the salvation it brings. Now, 2,000 years ago, our blessed Lord, and it was his choice, our blessed Lord chose the cross to be his instrument of salvation. And this had been prophesied throughout the Old Testament. It was by a tree. Think of this. It was by a tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that the old Adam fell. So it would be by the tree of the cross that the new Adam would gain victory. And yes, it was through the wood of Noah's ark that the human species was saved. And it was by the wood of the cross that man is saved from the shipwreck of sin and finds the port of heaven. But all we should know that this is a strange instrument to choose. The cross is literally an instrument of humiliation and execution. It's a scandal to the Jews. It's foolishness to the pagans. Yet Christ takes the greatest delight in it. For the cross would be that weapon he would use to defeat Satan, our greatest enemy, and sin, our greatest obstacle to union with God, And death, our greatest fear. In the Holy Gospel, our Lord stated over and over again, if we do not take up the cross, if we do not take up this cross, we are going to reject the victory it brings. The cross has brought military victories to many, but more importantly, the cross has won spiritual battles and has saved countless souls. We must absolutely have the cross touch us, For Christ welcomes no one who does not have the effects of the cross in his soul. And Christ enlists no soldier in his church militant who does not take up his own cross and use it as a weapon. You see, if the cross is Christ's weapon, if the cross is Christ's weapon who is the head of the church, then the cross is also the weapon since we are members of his mystical body, our weapon, head and body, Use the same instrument. 
Now, the best way for the cross to touch us and the easiest way is through the holy sacraments. We are given a share in the victory of Calvary when we receive them. But there are other ways that the cross can come into our lives. The sufferings and pains, the difficulties that arise, the weight of responsibility, the salvation of our soul and those of others around us will oftentimes depend upon whether we take up that cross or we reject it. That cross has been measured out for us, sometimes from all eternity. And God has allowed us to have it as a weapon to use. And believe me, since the cross saves, crosses will necessarily come into your life. Now, there are many types of crosses in life that one can be fixed to. There's the cross of physical pain. A priest I used to live with suffered from premature arthritis. Though he was only two rooms down from me, and only in his early 50s, I could literally hear him groaning in agony as he tried to rise out of bed. Other crosses include the death of a loved one, great sorrow, being criticized, too many duties weighing you down, and yes, financial problems, crushing debt, humiliations, and yes, misunderstandings amongst friends. What a terrible cross that is, misunderstandings amongst friends. And the list goes on and on. Consider, too, the cross of darkness. The cross of darkness, that is not knowing what will necessarily happen in the future. We're in the dark about the future. Once my father came home and announced to my mother that he had cancer. But the doctors, at least at that time, weren't exactly sure what type of cancer it was. Now, if you know much about cancer, you know this terrible disease has various kinds of cancers. Could be pancreatic cancer, could be lymphoma. Well, most pancreatic cancers are terminal, but lymphoma is often treatable. But my mom and dad didn't know what kind of cancer it was. This was a cross for them as they waited in their dark night. And even though the cancer my father had was treatable, a few full year of chemotherapy and a brutal course of it was still a great cross for both of them. A Calvary lived out like that of Jesus and Mary. Two more times he had cancer, one prostate cancer and a recurrence of lymphoma, which often comes back. And I remember just a few weeks ago, I was doing a mission with Father in Richmond, New Hampshire, and I got a call at 3 a.m. from one of my relatives who said that my Aunt Sandy had had a major stroke. A major stroke. This woman was 56 years old. I had just spent Christmas with her and the entire family doing a traditional Latin Mass wedding overseas. And what a beautiful event it was. She had just found out that her eldest daughter, who had been married, had been with child, was just being uh, pronounced as pregnant. And yet this particular woman at 56 years old, in the fittest of health, had a major, major stroke that was going to create a terminal condition. I couldn't believe it as I hung up the phone. I was only priest, I guess, around. She was down in Hartford, Connecticut. So I got in the car and I drove down from New Hampshire through Massachusetts and into Connecticut. There was no other priest available. It was a Sunday morning. But then I began to think about this. Why would God allow this to happen? 56 years old, just to see her daughter married, going to be a grandmother soon. But then I remembered, wait a minute, I'm from Kentucky. Why was I in New Hampshire at that particular time? God was taking care of things even in the midst of great suffering, even in the midst of the evil of a death like that. All these examples are truly evils that happen in the world. And you can blame our first parents, Adam and Eve, for causing us such troubles. The good Lord did not bring sickness, pain, disease, nor death into this world. We did. Such sufferings are the result of sin. But God in his goodness allows evil for the sake of bringing good out of it. He allows evil for the sake of bringing good out of it, including the good of saving crosses and sources of grace that can unite us evermore to our Lord, who loved the cross even to the point of his own death. Do not reject the cross. 
Because in so doing, you will bring damnation to yourself. Take up your cross. See the difficulty as a blessing. See the suffering in your life even as an opportunity. See the cross behind, hidden behind the evil. With the eyes of faith, see it as an opportunity. And realize the greater the struggle, the greater the graces. And so let us use our sicknesses. Let us wield our humiliations as a sword in a battle for souls. It is the key to the pearly gates. Now, after our dear Lord rose from the dead in triumph, after our dear Lord rose from the dead, his risen body, as we well know, still bore the wounds of his crucifixion. But the holes caused by the nails and spear in his hands, feet, and side now shine in heaven as glorious trophies and as wondrous medals proclaiming his victory in spiritual combat. Jesus, the warrior of charity, returned home with his cross and wearing those red ribbons of love. Now, if we want to enter heaven one day in triumph, we're going to have our own wounds. Jesus, our judge, will look for our own battle scars that will tell of our struggles, our story. And it's always interesting to look at the statues and the paintings of the martyrs which the church specially venerates. Those men who took down, who took up their cross, those women who took up their cross to the point of shedding their blood. The martyrs are often seen holding the actual instruments of their death, which is the instrument they used as a weapon to gain victory. And so whenever you see a statue of St. Stephen, the first martyr, the great deacon of old, he's always shown holding stones in his hand because he was stoned to death. But in heaven, those same stones are now part of his story and his glory because those stones helped build his mansion above. St. Lawrence, the other deacon of Rome in the early church, is always pictured with an iron grill at his side. You see, Lawrence was literally roasted alive for the Catholic faith. And while roasting on that grill, the good deacon turned to his executioner, as many of us know, and said, you can turn me over now. I'm done on this side. But now, Lawrence experiences every day, every moment, the fires of divine love. Then there is the Holy Virgin Martyr Lucy. St. Lucy was always shown holding her eyes upon a plate. These eyes were, were literally taken out of their sockets as a punishment, as a torture, as she died for the faith. But they are now her trophies, and she sees God face to face now. In Michelangelo's painting, The Last Judgment, we see that Apostle St. Bartholomew pictured in that great mural behind the main altar in the Sistine Chapel. St. Bartholomew is pictured literally holding his entire skin, for he was literally flayed alive for professing Christ as Lord. But this great apostle will get his flesh back, whole and entire, and yes, glorified. And yes, the apostle St. Paul, who we see above the main altar, yes, he's pictured with a sword because he had the privilege as a Roman citizen, of being beheaded as opposed to crucified. But that same head will come back to that body in the glory of the resurrection, and that head will wear a crown. St. Pio Petrocina is literally the only priest in church history that bore the wounds of Christ, the stigmata in his hands, his feet, and his side. For 50 years, Padre Pio Stigmata demonstrated to the world the power of the cross as well as the meaningfulness, the meaningfulness of human suffering accepted in loving union with Christ and in resignation to that pain. When a woman asked Padre Pio if the wounds, those bleeding wounds hurt, he responded, do you think the good Lord gave me these wounds for decoration? They were a sign. And yes, to those skeptics in the modern world, he only died in 1968, to those skeptics in the modern world that said that somehow through the power of mental suggestion, the stigmata appeared one day on Padre Pio's body and stayed there for 50 years, he suggested those skeptics go out to a field and look at a bull 
and then pretend to be the bull and see if all of a sudden by mental suggestion they start to grow horns. Padre Pio was what we call a victim soul. He was a walking crucifix. And his nightshirt, his pajamas, literally every night were another shroud of Turin. Our wounds, our battle scars when we die may not be so red. And yes, they may not be so glorious. But taking up the cross of one's duties, taking care of an elderly parent, an infirm spouse, a handicapped child, or a rebellious teenager, just may be your key to open heaven's gate. Just living a Christian vocation in the face of a modern culture that opposes any traditional values, being a loyal spouse in an age of infidelity, being an obedient son, a loving daughter to parents and elders in a time of unprecedented disobedience, all these crosses will bring victory. But it must be admitted in conclusion that we're sometimes carpenters of our own cross. We make it. We build it. That is, we provide our own punishments and sufferings due to our own sinful behavior. Substance abuse can provide the cross of addiction. Our gossiping tongues scourge others, and they will make our heart very hard and closed to charity. Sins against the Sixth and Ninth Commandments can bring emotional woundedness and physical diseases. Abortion can cause the cross of despair, where one thinks that there is no forgiveness possible. But when we have indulged ourselves in sin and have suffered the unhappy consequences, know that taking up the cross that we literally carved out for ourselves can turn that evil of our own sin into the good of penance. And the first and best step always on the way of the cross is going to confession. And that sacrament of healing, the crucified Christ will touch you with his saving cross. And after one's sins have been forgiven in the confessional, a life of voluntary penance is needed to atone for the past. In the sanctuary this evening, we are fortunate to have a relic of the true cross founded by that great woman, St. Helen. Let us adore a piece of that sacred tree with a kiss or a touch and be inspired to take up our own cross as a result. And let us also be inspired to display proudly the crucifix in our homes, in our neighborhoods, even in public, for it is the banner and throne of Christ the King. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.